We are entering into the last section of the book, all right? So it's been a quite a long study, but we're entering into uh, section seven, looking at the doctrine of the future. And tonight, as we uh, look at our study, do you want the condensed version and go on home uh, <laughs> class, or do you want us to walk through the outline? So, uh, yeah, you want to walk through the outline. Uh, but we're looking at the return of Christ, uh, when and how, looking at... Um, when and how Christ will return. Could he come back at any hour? Kind of answering those questions and coming down to the realization of some things that, you know, we go back to Deuteronomy passage. There's some things that we just don't know. All right. Uh, there's one thing I can assure you of. He is coming back. He will come back suddenly, visibly and bodily. And uh, he will come back and uh, it'll all pan out in the end. So the question, the thing is, be ready. All right. So uh, be ready for his return. Uh, in this chapter, we begin this last unit uh, looking at the study of, of future events or the study of last things. Uh, and we call that study what? Eschatology. OK. Uh, and so although Although we can't know everything about the future is what Grudem says, uh, God knows all those things. God knows everything about the future. Uh, and he has uh, pointed us to those truths in the scripture, told us about major events that will come about in history of the universe. And one thing that we can be sure of is that God does not lie and we can hold him to his word because uh, he never lies. So we can have confidence in what his word tells us. So I gave you an outline I just expanded that. It turned out to be pretty long, and I cut some stuff out of it just for your sake. Uh, but we'll walk through this together. Uh, one of the things that we learned is that there will be a sudden, personal, visible, bodily return of Jesus Christ. And um, why is it important for us to... Uh, to know this doctrine and understand this doctrine? Why is it important for us to agree on that term? What are some of the false things that are said about the return of Christ? He said he'd come back. Okay, he said, that wasn't false, but some of the false things he said, he, he's, you know, some of the things that are being taught out there are that he's not physically coming back, right? Uh, that he will in some way a spirit come back and that in the sense that uh, the spirit of Christ will come back and it will just mean that there will be an acceptance of his teaching and his lifestyle of love and that we'll accept those things and we'll keep moving forward. Uh, but that is not what he promised and what the word of God tells us. So it's important that we understand that just as Jesus Christ physically rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, uh, he is going to come back in that same way and uh, return uh, to earth. Uh, there's many scriptures supporting Christ's sudden, personal, visible, and bodily return. Uh, let's look at some of those together. Matthew 24, uh, 44, uh, it tells us, Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Uh, John 14, 3 uh, John 14, 3 is another passage, and we know the John passage as he's uh, talking to his disciples. But 14, 3 says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I will come again and receive you unto myself, right? Uh, Acts 1.11. Acts 1.11 is another passage that we can look at. And we know that uh, we find that Jesus Christ gives us the commission uh, to go into all the world in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And then in verse 11, uh, we find that he says these things and, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven as Jesus has ascended? This Jesus who was taken uh, up from you into heaven heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So we see over and over uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 talks about the visible uh, return of Jesus Christ. And so you know, as we look at that passage, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of a command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. So Jesus Christ is coming back physically. He's coming back in bodily form. He's coming back personally. And we should, uh, then we find, eagerly uh, long for Christ's return. And so we see that. Now, Grudem says in his writing, and he says uh, the, the words of John in, in Revelation, um, Amen, come Lord Jesus, should be the very thing that characterizes our heart, that we should have this longing for the return of Christ. 
that we should have this expectancy for the return of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 16, 22, uh, there's a word that is used and it's Maranatha, right? Maranatha, which is similar to that, which means, O Lord, come. All right. So we should have this expectancy that Jesus Christ should return. Now, why should we eagerly await uh, Christ's return? Uh, wh why should we be longing for that? This world is not our home. This world is not our home, exactly. And so we should be longing for Christ's return because we find that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are citizens of heaven, right? Uh, and that Philippians passage tells us that we are, are, this is not our home. And so we should be longing to go home, right? We are sojourners in this world and we should have a desire to be with our Savior uh, for eternity. What can keep us from having this longing uh, in our hearts? What are some things that Grudem said would keep us from having that longing in our hearts? Not being obedient. Okay, lack of obedience, all right. Love of the world. All right, being caught up with the things of the world, all right. Anything else? All right, we find that we could be caught up in the things of the world. We find that we could neglect our fellowship and our personal relationship with Christ. So we may, we may give verbal testimony of a relationship with Christ, but we may not be doing those things to grow and mature in our faith. And so we may be neglecting our spiritual disciplines. And so because we are not connected to, to Christ through our personal devotion, then we may not have this longing. And typically when we are not personally devoted and, and, and living out our spiritual disciplines, typically we are then caught up in the things of the world, right? Uh, there are other things that have our attention more than our relationship with Jesus Christ. So uh, those things can keep us from this uh, eagerly expectation and longing for Christ. What are the things that can increase this longing? He, he spells some things out. What will increase our longing for heaven and our longing for Christ's return? All right, we want to see his face. We want to be united with him. All right. He gives some other things that, that are there too. He says that when we experience persecution and suffering uh, and those things come into our life, we have this longing uh, for Christ to come and return. Uh, if you've ever walked, and, and I just experienced this with my parents. Today is a year ago that we, we had the funeral for my mom. And just a few months ago, of course, you know, my dad passed. And as he's in the in the hospital and talking with him and seeing him sick and suffering, there was a longing in my dad's life for for Christ to just come and receive him home and and, and for him to experience the eternal life that he had hoped for. So when we are experiencing those things in our life, it gives us this longing uh, for Christ to come and to receive us. And, and not only that, we can have this persecution. And so we can then long for Christ to physically come. When you has anybody watched the news today? <laughs> if you have watched the news today, you went away from the, the TV set going, come, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, come, Lord Jesus, come because of the, the state of our world. I mean, uh, you look at the situation around us and you long for Christ to come and establish his kingdom forever. Uh, but a growing love and devotion for Christ will also give us a great uh, longing uh, for him to come and return. Uh, what does Grudem say about what we should do in the meantime? What should we do in the meantime? Should we stop work? Sell everything, uh, get in our lazy boy and kick back and just look. <laughs> so, you know, he says that we're to continue on with our lives. All right. If we're seeking education, we go for an education. If we're working on if we're working on something that's a, of great importance, a project that we continue to do the project, we we continue to live our life. And he points to the Matthew 24 uh, passage, 44 through 46, where it says, <clears throat> So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come with an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at proper time? And it will it will be good for that servant whose master finds him what? doing so when he returns. So we're to be about God's work. We're to be about the things that God has put in front of us. So 
If we're a doctor, we keep on being a doctor. If, if we're a scientist, we keep on looking for answers. Uh, whatever we are called to do, we do it all for the glory of God and we continue to do so to the day He returns. And we, we seek to be that faithful servant uh, that Christ will find when He makes His return. Um, do we know when Christ is going to return? Okay. I came to the next section. You know, we don't know when Christ will return. Now, we see that consistently uh, in the scriptures throughout the gospel. The passage uh, that we just looked at, Matthew 24, uh, we look at that again uh, in Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the master of the house had known when part the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not let his house be broken into. So we have this command to, to, be, to be ready, to know that we don't know the hour of the day. Matthew 25, uh, 13, as we also see, Watch therefore, for you do not know neither the day nor the what? The hour, all right? Uh, Mark chapter 13 uh, is a passage that points to this as well. When we look at Mark chapter 13, verses 32 through 33, but concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only who? Only the Father, only the Father. So be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. So consistently throughout the teaching of the Gospels, we find that we just don't know when Christ is going to come. What is the point of the passages that Jesus is saying you do not know? Uh, you see, he's telling us that we cannot know when he's coming back, that it's going to be in an unexpected time. So we should be what? Be prepared. We should be ready. Uh, we should always keep our eyes looking up, so to say, uh, and, and knowing that he could come. Uh, and we just don't know when. Now, what do we do with the claims um, of people saying that they know the date and the time of Christ's return? It says reject them, right? <laughs> reject them is incorrect because if anyone knew, uh, Christ said, you know, no one knows, right? Now, have there been people who have said this is the day, this is the day, and this is the hour? Yeah, we've seen that throughout history, all right? It hadn't happened, has it? Hope not, huh? <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, a question that keeps going around in my mind is, mm -hmm. We know certain things, and so we know it's a seven-year period. We don't know the day or the hour, but we have a general idea if, I know he doesn't think we'll be here for the tribulation, and I don't know, of course nobody knows, but, you know, so it's, it's like be ready, be ready, be ready, but I also know that the tribulation is seven years long, and I also know, you know, by reading the last book in the Bible, things that are going to happen along the way. And so, in, in a way, it's like, well, what's this? It can happen in a day or hour because we do have a time frame. We don't know when it's going to start. And he, and he answers some of those questions and tries to answer in this chapter. Well, Next I chapter, know, we'll get more. Yeah. Next chapter, we'll get more into the millennial views, which we're not looking at tonight. I'm a pan millennialist. Jesus is coming back. He said so. Uh, be ready. Uh, I don't know the day or the hour, but uh, I know he said be ready. So, you know, can I hope that it's premillennial dispensationalism? Yeah, we can all hope so. Yeah, right before it gets bad, Jesus is going to come. We're going to poof in the air and all is going to be well. But we're not. There are differing views. And, but and, but that's not my point. Yeah. My, my point is, has nothing to do with the rapture. Uh-huh. With the signs? We, we have signs. We know a lot. Well, we know some about the tribulation from Revelation. We know from Daniel, and we know from Revelation that it's going to be seven years long. So, um, when it says, be ready, be ready, you can come at any time, I, I, it's like, yeah, I... I wouldn't know the day or the hour that he's going to be here, but I do know generally 
if the tribulation starts, then it's going to be seven years long. I know if the Antichrist sets himself up in the temple of Jerusalem, that's going to be three and a half years from now. So, yeah, I think that, you see what I'm saying? I, I, yeah, and I think what it comes from is um, when you read Revelation, there are certain things in it that you take as these have to be literal. That it has to be seven years. It has to be three and a half years. But then, even among, even in the same perspective of Revelation, you're going to find things in there that you're going to say, this isn't literal. This is a figure. And so the differences come in when, <coughs> when I see that, I see seven years uh, in and amongst a lot of other figurative language. And so I don't see a literal seven-year tribulation. And in some senses, I agree with what his discussion of we don't know when the tribulation starts, and we don't even know if it may have already started. And so that's the, the what comes in is when do you take it, when does it have to be, and I'll put this as a question, not as an answer, because I think this is a difficult subject, is does it have to be seven years, literally? Does Israel, 144,000, is that a real, literal number, or is that representative or something? And I think a lot of people would argue that they're figures and not literal numbers. So that's, that's just the difference, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, all in, it's all in where you fall and what you believe and, and the things that you come to interpret and understand. And there's, there are differing, varying views in which he points that out. There are not reasons to separate fellowship over. They're secondary things. The reality is, is that Jesus is coming back and to be ready. And those are the words that Jesus told us. So he says, you will not know the hour of the day, uh, so be ready. Uh, and so my thing is, and this is the way I've always approached it. That's why I said we could be done in five minutes. <laughs> my approach to this has always been trust Jesus for what he said. He said, I'm coming back, be ready. And so my thing is not so much to worry and try to figure it out, but to be faithful in the days that he gives me here. And so I, I could worry of trying to figure out end times, but only God knows. And there are a lot of smart people who have given a lot of their lives trying to figure this out, and they all come up with a different answer. And so, so my thing is, is trust in what Jesus says, <laughs> live your life in faithfulness to him, and be ready when he comes. And so... That's why I say we could be done with that, but uh, he's coming back, so, so be ready, all right? Um, in that, we don't know, but uh, there are people who've claimed. Uh, all evangelicals agree that the final results of Christ's return, I, I think we'll, we all agree with this, there'll be the judgment of the unbelievers, all right, when Christ returns. Uh, there'll be the final reward of believers where there'll be an end to sorrow, end to, end to sin, there'll be an end to suffering in this life. Um, there'll be eternal life with Christ in new heaven and new earth, or He will establish uh, those things. Uh, there will be the never-ending reign and worship of our God, is what He points out. Uh, all of these things, He even says, are going to be covered more as we continue through this unit, right? And uh, so He's not getting into those things tonight, but just looking at the things we do agree on. Uh, there are some disagreements over details of future events, and you kind of see this. Uh, we, we don't all land in the same place, all right? Um, it's important to acknowledge that Bible-believing Christians have differences over specific details leading up to and immediately following Christ's return, all right? Uh, the differences are based on varying interpretations of key passages regarding future events. And so you're just kind of looking and trying to map it out. You'll kind of get into this, and he alluded to it, but... Um, even in dealing with uh, this premillennial dispensationalism and the rapture of the church, it's a relatively late development in the history of the church in the, in the 1800s, right? And so, you know, it's, an, it's a new thing that has come about. Uh, and the thing he says is these, these matters are of secondary importance. Um, these aren't the things that matter. What matters is that he is coming back. He's given us a commission and a command to go and tell and to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ and to live our lives faithfully for Him. 
And so th that's the baseline and the foundation of all that is there. Uh, and so we look at those things. Uh, it's good to form one's own opinion. And you go around the room, you have different opinions about it all. Uh, and the reality is, is that we may not all land in the same place, but uh, when Jesus returns, we all will end in the same place. All right. Uh, uh, and we, we just don't know those things. The question came about, could Christ come back at any time? And he points to a lot of the things that we're looking at and some of the questions that we have. So there are verses that predict a sudden and unexpected coming of Christ. We've looked at some of those already where he says, you know, uh, be ready. I'm, I'm coming back. You don't know the hour and the day. There's this sense of urgency in those passages, right? That, that hey, he is coming. We don't know when it's going to be. So it's, it's important for us to be faithful in this time to live our lives to his glory. So as we see that there are passages that talk about the, the very fact that Christ could come back at any time, there are also passages that say that there's things that have to happen uh, and precede his return, right? And so we kind of look at some of those things, all right? Uh, one is the preaching of the gospel to all nations, right? He says that the gospel is going to be preached to all nations. Mark chapter 13, the passage that uh, we looked at just a moment ago, but Mark chapter 13 uh, in verse 10, uh, he says these words, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all uh, nations in Matthew 24 uh, passage in verse 14 and the gospel of the kingdom will be will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations and then the end will come and so we see this preaching of the gospel to all nations it says that the great tribulation will precede all right his his return all right Mark chapter 13 if we go back to that passage again verses 19 and 20. Mark chapter 13, 19 through 20 says, for, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been, uh, has, has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and will never be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect he, uh, whom he chose, he shortened those days. And so we see this idea. Now, the question is, is, is that a tribulation that is to come? Is that a tribulation that we're currently in? And there are different opinions on what that tribulation looks like and when that is. Uh, false prophets working signs and wonders. Uh, Mark chapter 13 again, as we look at that passage. Mark chapter uh, 13 verse 22 for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders and lead astray, if possible, the elect. Uh, and so we see that pro false prophets are going to rise up. They're going to work wonders. There are going to be signs in heaven. It says in that Mark 13 passage that, um, that in those days, in, in 24 through 26, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in heaven will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and great glory. So there are going to be signs in the heavenly realms, okay? Um, the coming of the man of sin and rebellion, the coming of the Antichrist uh, is what is speaking of there. And so 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 18 is one of the passages uh, that he points to. So uh, if you look at that passage in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 18, children, it is the last hour as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. All right. Uh, now, when John is writing those things, they're already Antichrists who have made their way onto the scene. Right. All right. So there are Antichrists who have made their way onto the scene. I'm talking about the salvation of Israel and, and looking at the aspect that there will be a large number of, of Jewish people who will come to faith in Jesus Christ. So, you know, what are some of the conclusions that he came up with uh, about these signs? Uh, some of the passages, and he says even some believers focus on predicted events required before Jesus' return. He says other passages and other believers focus on the imminence of Christ's return, that he's coming soon, uh, that he's a soon coming king. All passages agrees that we are to actively watch and wait, but it doesn't tell us how long we are to wait and how long that's going to be. It just says watch and wait, and he's promised that he's going to come. So the question still remains, 
could Jesus return at any time? Uh, or must certain events occur first? So he gives some possible solutions, all right? Uh, he gives possible solutions, but he never answers the question fully, right? Uh, which is why we go back to Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Be ready, all right? So the possible solutions. Christ could simply come at any time soon. Since these events will take uh, much time, uh, he could not come at any time soon. Since these events that are to precede it uh, will take much time to unfold, all right? And so the people who are looking at these events in the literal sense that these things have to come kind of along a timeline are thinking that all these things have to unfold first and then the coming of Christ, all right? Uh, so there's some difficulties with that view that he points out. What were some of the difficulties with the view that all of these things must take place before Christ's return? Okay, it, it kind of goes, it's kind of contrary to, to Jesus' own explicit warnings, right? Uh, to actively watch and wait, all right? So if I'm just waiting on events, then I'm not watching and waiting for the king, all right? Uh, so it's contrary to what he says. It also negates this sense of urgency and, and this expectancy of Christ's return. Uh, it, it can negate the fact that, that we're looking for him. And if, if we're always looking for events, what can, we, what can it lead to in our own lives? And, and that's the next thing. The purpose of the signs are in, in, to encourage and caution followers. However, this solution seems to provide an excuse for complacency. You see, if we think all of these things must transpire, then I can kind of just lag back in my faithfulness, right? Well, then why would he tell us these things? All right. And they're different. Well, then that's where there's different interpretations of when these things have taken place. And are they have they already taken place? Are they coming? Are we in the middle of them? And so all of these things are kind of unanswered questions. So I think I think we look and we, we hold on to the fact of what Jesus says. I'm coming at a day and an hour that you do not know <laughs> and be ready. Watch and wait uh, and be ready. And in the midst of that. We do what He's called us to do. We live our lives to the glory of Christ and we be faithful to the things that He has commissioned us to do. And that is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations. And that is to tell the people around our community, around our nation of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ because He's given us a plan uh, that we're to live out in our lives. And so we, we, we look at those things. Solution number two says that Christ in fact could return at any moment as all the signs have been fulfilled. So if we're looking at signs, Grudem goes and says, there's, there's another group of people who says, hey, everything that says is coming has already been fulfilled. Therefore, Christ could come at any moment, right? So that's what he's pointing to in saying that some say this, that all the signs have been fulfilled. Two possibilities uh, with the solution. Uh, the first, that there will be two separate, what? Second comings, Right. So there, there are those who believe that there are two se separate second comings. There's one where he comes to the air and the clouds and he raptures his church and he takes them away and the times of tribulation will come and then he'll return again at the second coming and he'll have the resurrection of the dead. So one is a secret to rapture Christians in the seven year, uh, before the seven-year tribulation and a public triumphal coming in which Christ comes to reign over the earth. This possibility, uh, a relatively recent, is difficult to validate from Scripture uh, and is going to be looked at in next week's lesson by Pastor Phil. So you'll get that teaching next week, all right? Now, uh, uh, hold, hold your questions about the rapture and the millennial to next week, and you'll read next week's chapter, and you'll get a little understanding on that too. Uh, second uh, thing with this is that the signs preceding uh, Christ's return have already been fulfilled. Possibly uh, when? Some say during the first century that these things all were fulfilled, right? Uh, under the persecution of the church under Roman Emperor Nero, so that Christ could indeed return at any time. Uh, however, many remain unconvinced because of the relatively smaller scale of these events and the longer uh, lapse of time that has taken place uh, since those things have transpired. So, you know, some believe that, you know, they're, they're, some of the things that are, that are laid out in Scripture are far greater than even what was experienced in the first century church. 
And so there's still some things coming, okay? The possible solution number three was to say that it's unlikely. <laughs> this was the, if I had a slide this week, this is what it would say. It's unlikely, but possible. <laughs> that was his key phrase uh, as you read this chapter. Uh, uh, to say it's unlikely but possible that most signs have already been fulfilled and therefore we simply cannot know with certainty at any point in history whether all the signs have been fulfilled or not. Uh, this solution takes seriously the need for the warnings and the encouragement that various signs bring. Uh, it takes seriously the fact that we cannot know the day nor the hour. Um, this solution can keep Christians in a good balance uh, of caution and encouragement uh, of what we're looking at. Um, but is it possible that these signs have been fulfilled? In each case, the conclusion that he comes down to is that it is unlikely, but possible. You see why I'm a pan-millennialist? You see? Yes. We, because we like to be in control, don't we? Yeah, we want to know the hour and the day. Because if I know the hour and the day that the master's coming back, I can have all things in order, right? Uh, and that makes all the difference. And so we kind of live in that realm where we do want to be our, on the throne of our own life and say, okay, I can predict this. And so now I can do how, as I want to uh, with not the caution that Jesus says, you don't know the hour and the day to be ready and to be sober in those things. So, so we have to be careful in that. So uh, unlikely but possible that the signs have been fulfilled uh, seems uh, already seems very reasonable that it's unlikely but possible. Then he goes back into looking at each one of those things, all right, uh, of why it's unlikely, all right. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 in the preaching of the gospel to all the nations that we saw. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 uh, verses 5 and 6. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the what? The whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace. Now, this is Paul writing to the church of Colossae, right? And he's saying that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing where? Throughout the whole world, all right? Throughout the whole world. So, so we see that possibly, it's unlikely, but possible that this has been fulfilled, right? Colossians 1.23, if you continue in your faith, establish and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to who? Every creature under heaven, all creation, and of which Paul, I have, which I, Paul, have become a servant. So possible, but unlikely that every creature under heaven has heard the gospel, right? Are there still people within our world that have yet to hear the gospel? Okay, all right, there are. Now, as Paul's writing this, uh, the gospel has spread in, in Paul's mind to all the what? Okay, all the known world, all right? Uh, and so we see these things. So this can be seen as unlikely but possible uh, that this sign has initially been fulfilled in the first century um, and has been fulfilled in greater sense many times since then. So Paul's writing that the whole world and all of creation has heard the gospel, but we know in reality that that continues to be fleshed out even in this day, right? Because there were people groups in this day who were engaged with the gospel probably for the first time. So it continues to take place. So it's unlikely that that has been fulfilled. What about the great tribulation? Language is used uh, in these warnings that describes tribulations that are far greater than what took place uh, in the first century. And so, you know, we have this anticipation that things are going to intensify and get worse uh, against the church. All right. Do we see things intensifying against Christians in the world today? OK. All right. Could we be <laughs> considered in the world today living in times of tribulation? OK. Possible. All right. Possible. All right. All right. 
Um, so, so we see that. Uh, many people have understood Jesus' warnings about the Great Tribulation to refer to Rome's siege of what? Jerusalem. Of Jerusalem, all right? Took place in 66 uh, to 70 A.D., all right? Um, however, there have been many periods of violent and intense persecution uh, throughout the history of our world, and they continue in this day, all right? So we see that there are times of tribulation that continue to come against the church, even in this day. Uh, he says, false prophets working signs and wonders, all right? Throughout the, throughout the history of our world, demonic miracles and false signs have been done uh, throughout, our, throughout centuries. And so demonic activity has, has always been there, all right? So it seems unlikely that Jesus' words predict a far greater, or it seems likely, not unlikely, that Jesus' words predict a far greater manifestation of demonic activity and false signs and wonders, all right? Do you see demonic activity on the rise in our world around us? You just look in our news today, and you can see the church of Satan uh, uh, claiming that their followers now should have rights to abortion for religious liberty, right? Tells you what abortion is, right? It's of, 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 of Satan, right? And so we see these things, and things are increasing. It's difficult to be certain uh, that this is what Jesus meant, um, and so it's best to conclude that it's unlikely, but possible that this sign has already been fulfilled. Signs in heavens, um, Matthew 24 passage talks about immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. We haven't seen that take place, have we? What does he say about the signs of heaven and how they may take place? He says that it could happen in an instant, right? So, you know, he, he, he says that, you know, that could, that could occur moments, if not minutes to hours before Christ's physical bodily return. And so, you know, he's pointed those things. Isaiah passage talks about the stars of heaven falling. But as we look at this, some people will attempt to explain all of this as symbolic language that refers to the first century destruction of Jerusalem and God's judgment on it. He points that out. Uh, but this language seems to refer to something far greater and more earth-shattering than the siege of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, okay? Um, this type of event could occur quickly uh, and pre uh, prelude uh, the Christ's return, all right? And so we see that. So it seems likely that this has not happened, but it could happen very quickly. Uh, and when we see these things happening... now. <laughs> I don't just want to live willy-nilly till I see the sun falling from the sky, right? <laughs> I feel be like Chicken Little. The sky is falling and I'll be running for cover, right? I, I, I would, you know, I don't want to have to wait till the sun and the, and the stars begin to fall out of the sky to have this realization that, hey, Jesus is, is making His return uh, because He's already promised uh, to, that He is coming. Uh, the appearance of the Antichrist or the man of lawlessness, um, he goes and says many historical figures uh, who've had great authority uh, have wreaked havoc in our world, have wreaked devastation among the peoples of our world. And, um, it, and you'll see when those people arise and come on the scene, what do people begin to say? They're the what? <laughs> they're the Antichrist, right? They begin to say, that's the Antichrist because of all the destruction that they're having. We've heard those terms in the last several years. Doesn't matter who's in power, does it? They're all the Antichrist, all right? Uh, because to somebody's side, they're always doing something evil, right? So we see these things of people in authority who, who uh, take on this. Scripture tells us in John chapter 2, 18, we looked at that passage a minute ago, that many Antichrists are expected, uh, but the, the Antichrist will come when? In the future that it will be a future coming of a man of lawlessness that will establish and set up what? A what? Okay, all right. A one world order, all right. Uh, so we see uh, this man of lawlessness is described in more uh, decisive terms in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. It says, don't let anyone deceive you in any way for that day will come, uh, will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Uh, the man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship. 
and sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. OK, therefore, it's unlikely, <laughs> but possible that that's been fulfilled. All right. Typically, I would say most everybody in here would say that that prophecy has not been fulfilled. All right. Uh, that we're looking uh, for the coming of the man of lawlessness. Um, when it comes to the salvation of Israel, uh, Romans, he points to Romans 9 through 11 and says that those chapters seem to indicate that there's going to be this massive ingathering of Jewish people that will turn uh, to Jesus Christ and place their faith in him as their Messiah. Uh, but he says it's not certain. Uh, that 9 through 11 actually predicts this. Uh, many have argued that no further ingathering of Jewish people will occur beyond what we have already seen through the history of the church. And so as the church goes out and seeks to evangelize the world, there are those who are coming to faith and there are people who have Jewish faith who are coming to Christ. And some saying that that is the ingathering. And he even points to the Apostle Paul who says that he is the chief example of that, right? Uh, that he is the example of the ingathering in Romans 11, 1 and 2, when he says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of, Benj of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? So it's unlikely, uh, uh, but possible that that sign has already been fulfilled. So, you know, what are some of the things that he tells us <laughs> as he comes out of this chapter? He, he didn't really give you all the answers, did he? We just don't know them. We just don't know them. And, um, you know, the thing we do know for certain is if you go back to the very beginning, the thing you do know for certain is that there will be a sudden, personal, visible, bodily return of Jesus Christ. You affirm that? Okay, we all affirm that. How and when and the day and the hour and what all will have to transpire before that happens, we just don't know. And that's why when I got this chapter, I kind of chuckled and told Jeff, I said, I can teach that in two minutes. I said, because Jesus is coming back. Be ready. That is simple and simplicity to me. And I know that's not the, you know, the digging into the meat of what you may want. But in my, in my pea brain, that's what I've always held on to. I can't answer all the questions of how and when it's going to happen and all the things that must take place. But I hold to the promise that when Jesus left this earth, he said, I'm coming back. And he said, watch and wait uh, and be ready for my return. And that's what I hold on to. Uh, people have, have put in years of study and people ask me, don't you like to study eschatology? No, I, I, I know it. Jesus is coming back <laughs> and he told me to be ready. And he gave me some things to do in the meantime, to be faithful to the call that he's placed on my life. And to live out my life in that way. So, you know, what are the conclusions? Um, except for the spectacular signs of heaven, which could occur in a short time, it seems unlikely, uh, but possible, <laughs> that the rest of these signs have taken place. I don't believe all these signs have been fulfilled. Um, so I, I will agree with that. Um, it seems re reasonable to take seriously the warnings that Jesus could come uh, when we are not expecting him. Did he say he could? Okay, so we should we should look at those passages with with caution and with with warning that Jesus could return at any time. And therefore, I need to be found faithful uh, when he does return. Nonetheless, <laughs> it seems reasonable to say that signs preceding his coming will probably yet occur in the future. Just threw you a curveball, didn't we? He can come at any time, but there's things that still have to take place. So you kind of hang on to those things that, yeah, there are probably things that still need to take place, but it does not negate the fact that I need to be found faithful. I need to live my life for His glory, and I need to understand the things that He's called me to do and not allow me looking for future signs to lead to complacency in my own life. Uh, because I think that's the danger that we can get into when we think that, okay, you know, when I start looking at all these events that say they've got to take place and 
man, I'm 57 years old. Man, it's probably not going to happen before. <laughs> I'm probably, I'm probably going to check out of this place before all these things take place, right? You may get to but, retire. I may get to retire, all right? But, but you know, as, as I think about those, and if I have this thing of, okay, I, I'm at this stage in my life, and if I think, okay, with all these expectations and things that are going to have to take place, uh, then I'm probably not going to be alive when the return of Christ comes. So I'll just be able to kick back, take it easy, rest, and, and wait. That's right. And that's right. That's right. But there are those who don't have that dynamic relationship with Christ, right? Uh, who, 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 are, who are looking to signs to, to know so that they can. You think there are people out in our world today who may look at the, the things, they know, may know Scripture and look at end time events and think, I've still got time to wait. There's plenty of time for me. I, I, there are people who will answer you that way. I, I've got time. Exactly. So every generation before us has thought we're that generation. But when they died, they met Christ face mm -hmm. to face. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, all these events really, for me personally... It doesn't matter because today may be your last day. I may, my next heartbeat may mm -hmm. touch yes. me in His presence. Yes. So I think we get caught up on all this. But I also, I also think that's the reason, kind of the reason, he's, as He knows... And look at and look at his parables and things that he used to teach. You know, we, we look at the the parables of, of the of the virgins, right? Uh, and keeping keeping the oil in the lamps, right? Uh, and those who who kind of neglected that, right? So he, he's always talking about being ready. Uh, there's a reasonable balance of caution, hope, expect, expectation, and vigilance in regards to Christ's coming, uh, in view of current events. Uh, that can be maintained for each generation. And you just said it. Every generation has thought this was the last, right? Uh, from the time I was a kid, uh, we were talking about the return of Christ because things in the world look bleak. Things in the world continue to grow dim and dark, right? But every now and then we see a glimmer of light that breaks forth, right? And revival breaks forth among people. And so for us, we can pray for great revival because as you look out in the world today, uh, there's a lot of hopelessness and a lot of people who are separated uh, from Jesus Christ that need to hear the hope of the gospel. And so it gives us, as we think about these things and how things may be progressing, um, you kind of look and you see signs today and you think, man, we must be close. Uh, we must be close. How can this world continue on like it's going? Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that we must always be ready. And that's, that's the great point because we never know uh, when we're called from this life to the next. Uh, God simply wants us to continue to long for His return and expect that it could happen at any time. Um, just looking with great expectancy and great anticipation. Uh, he goes on to say this, it's spiritually unhealthy for us to say that we know that these signs have not occurred. And it seems to stretch the bounds of credible interpretation to say that we know that these signs have occurred. So it, it, we, we just, he, he don't know. That's why I said, uh, Jesus is coming. <laughs> what do we need to do? Be ready. Be ready. Uh, you know, as I looked at the whole chapter, you said I had a softball to hit tonight. <laughs> well, not really. I mean, there were a lot of questions, but... He had a softball, and the softball was this, that Jesus is coming. Uh, that's the truth. He has promised it. Uh, he told us to watch and to wait and to be ready, and that's what we're called to do, and uh, to live in faithfulness to Him uh, each and every day of our life. I, I don't have all the answers. Uh, and you know what encourages me? Neither does this man. That encourages me. Because he's a lot smarter than me. And he doesn't know all the answers. And you know what? Jesus said, you're not going to know. No one's going to know. 
So there's different interpretations of how you look at end times. And that's why for so much of my time, I've not gotten stuck into the study of eschatology because I can't figure it out. And I go back to the Deuteronomy passage that says there's some things that are in the mind of God that we just will never know. And um, I have to rest in that. But I, the things I do know, I take to heart and I live in faithfulness to Him. And that's what I have to rest in. Any, anybody, any other questions? We get, I finished early. <laughs> I finished early, so I could take another question. But it won't deal with the millennials because you're going there next week, all right? All right. Yes. It's not really a question, but really just a comment. I, I thought you asked a, a great question. Yes. Which yeah. was, why did he write it? And I say it's a great question because that's the <laughs> question we should apply every time we open. And, and I know that we have a tendency, especially around eschatology, it's the one subject where you hear it just the same way Gruden describes it. There's been varying opinions on this and varying understandings, and we still fellowship it. But it's really the only one where we're allowed to be not so dogmatic about it. Right? <laughs> if there's more dogmatic arguments about other doctrines. Mm -hmm. But the tendency can be, well, because it's just so nobody knows, let's not worry about it. But I think that's the wrong mentality. I think he wrote it, he put it there for a reason, uh, and so we should study it. And then we, we inquire of the word, and we study it, and when we reach the end of the understanding of it, we... We drop it and say that's the end of my understanding. Of all my study of it, I come back to my words <laughs> that I just don't understand it. And you study it, and I come to the same conclusion um, that I have to rest in what Jesus said. And so I think that's where we are. And I think there are. There, it's not bad questions. I just think we can't have all the answers. I, I, remember, I remember sitting down with someone who laid out all the charts and taught it as fact. And I came away from that going, all these things have to take place as a teenager and looking at all these things. And we were in that. We were in the midst of it in the 1980s. You know, we thought we were in the midst of it. And then you go off and you and you learn a little bit more. And I'm going, I, I come away from eschatology more confused than I did when I went in there. Right. Because the answers were I just didn't know. But what I did know is what Jesus said. And that's what I had to rest on. Uh-huh. But you know, there's a blessing at in Revelation for reading Revelation. So why? Because the book God reveals about himself and the hope that we have in him and as things get so bad, we know who God is, we know the greatness of God, we know that he's in control and we can trust. And I think that is really a, a benefit to having a grasp on this stuff, some kind of grasp on this stuff, because Revelation really is very comforting to read because we see God's work. Yeah, I think... We go back to our Revelation study on YouTube, and so I'll give it a plug. You can go back to that and rewatch those things. I think Pastor Phil did an outstanding job teaching through that book of Revelation in a way that did not get mired in all the, all the stuff that's out there, but just presented it as scriptures uh, taught it. Uh, and, and, and I hear it is good to study, and I agree with those things. It just, out of all the study I've done, I still come back to the simplicity of my statement. And that's, that's what I'm telling you. I'm not trying to tell you that I'm simple and I, I don't care to look at it. I've looked at it and I've still come to the conclusion that Jesus said it, I believe it, and I'll just be faithful to what He's called me to do. I, hate that, I hope that that's not too simple an answer. That's just where a simple country boy from Tuscaloosa, Alabama kind of landed. All right? And, uh, and I just rest in that because... If he said it, I can take it to the bank and, um, and just go with that. So I think, you, you know, not easy, not an easy chapter. So it's not a softball because I would love to stand and, and teach a chapter and have all the answers for you. But have you found anything to be 
Have you found any, all the answers in any chapter that you've been through in the study? No, because there's different, there's different things. Now, there's some things that there's no question about and we have to land on. But there's other things that we just have to kind of rest in, that there's going to be different interpretation and we have to kind of rest that and, and be in fellowship with one another and understanding that God is faithful uh, to His children. All right, in those ways. Any other question? Colossians 3, 1 through 4. I think it's really applicable today. Mm -hmm. uh, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, mm -hmm. where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ mm -hmm. in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I like his past tense, the way he describes it. Uh, it's an exhortation to live as if the promises have already been mm -hmm. accomplished. And so the, the promises you're referring to in Revelation, the ones that, that show us, that demonstrate to you, is that God does keep his promises. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the exhortation to the Colossians is to live as though, you know, that's already occurred to you. Mm -hmm. and, and to live with your mind on godly things and on things above. Uh, we get caught up in living with our with our mind on the things here, uh, and uh, and so we keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, and we run the with endurance the race that He sets before us, and um, and as we run that race with endurance, uh, uh, when He returns, uh, we will be found faithful, and we will hear, hear our Savior say, "Well done, my good and faithful servant." Right, and so we run the race in that way and just live for His glory day by day. And so if, if there's any encouragement to you, that's what I encourage you to do. Live for the glory of Christ in this day and the days to come. And trust in Him uh, with the things that will come in the future, for He is faithful. All right, let's pray. Fathers, we come before you tonight. We thank you for the time that you've given us. We thank you for your Word. And Father, we have to admit that... Um, as we study, we come away many times with more questions than answers. And uh, Father, that's okay. Because we know that you are God and we are not. And our minds cannot grasp sometimes the things of glory. So in these moments, would you help us um, to discern those things that are most important in our own hearts and lives? Would you give us wisdom in each day of how you would have us live our lives for you and for your glory. And Father, would you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, empower us and equip us to be the men and women that you have called us to be. Father, as uh, we live our lives, may we always uh, keep our eyes lifted up with great anticipation and expectancy that one day our King will return. And when He returns, we will be with Him forever. So, Father, we rejoice in that hope. We rejoice in that truth. And we know uh, that that is a promise that we can hold on to. So in this day, uh, would you help us, uh, strengthen us, and encourage us in our faith and in our walk with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.